Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Thursday night. My name is Leanne Gibelli. I am the new um, director of programming here at Village Preservation. And I'm so thrilled to have Paul Kaplan with us today. Um, but before we get started, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Village Preservation and then we'll get underway. So here at Village Preservation, we've been documenting and celebrating um, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development, while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host a number of programs every year, over 70 typically, and most of them are free and open to the public. Um, and we are a nonprofit though, so we do appreciate your support either as a member, you can join as a member or donate. So if you wanna find out more about us, you can visit our website, villagepreservation.org consider becoming a member and then even consider a donation. And you'll see there's a, going to be some links that uh, my colleague Hugh will place into the chat. So you can do that. Um, and I would just like to say also in this transition, I really wanna honor my colleague Hugh. They have been so helpful in getting things going and keeping things going as I came in. So I just wanted to publicly acknowledge Hugh and their hard work because it's been really helpful to get people like Paul to join us today. So just a little bit of Zoom protocol. Um, he won't be visible during the talk, my colleague, myself, I might not be, but we'll be answering your questions and lobbing them to Paul. And so if you need anything, please feel free to use the chat for any kind of things that need to be happening for the webinar. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button. Um, and with that all said, I'm going to introduce Paul Kaplan. Paul, we're so glad you'll join us tonight and tell us all about New York in the progressive era. Um, Paul writes under three series, cultural guides, social history and bio biographies and business and technology marketing, and also has started to do book reviews. Uh, this is his 58th talk, which is exciting. He speaks globally in venues like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, the Union League Club. So we're really happy that he's here with us and he's recently appeared. You might've heard him on NPR, um, seen him on PBS. He earned a BA in ethics, politics, and economics from Yale College and an MBA from Yale School of Management. Uh, enjoys traveling and has visited six continents. I'm not there yet, Paul. I'm on your heels and 50, all of 50 US states. Um, and has worked in marketing for over 20 years for publishing financial and technology companies. So we're just so thrilled to be able to bring you someone as prestigious and also just so knowledgeable about what we do and the type of work we do here. So Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, terrific. Well, Leanne, thanks very much for that intro. Um, can you all hear me okay? We're good on that? Okay, I'll assume yes. So um, I want to thank um, Leanne and Hugh for their efforts in, in helping put this together. And I also just want to thank, as I think many of you on this call do, everyone at the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation for the really amazing and important and essential work that you do every day to um, do the educational and cultural programming, and especially in preserving a lot of the history of this ever-changing city. So thanks for all you do, the advocacy work, terrific. Okay, so with that, um, we are going to talk about New York in the progressive era. Um, we're gonna have some fun together. I'm, I'll kind of ask you some questions as we go along, which you could put in the chat, and Hugh will be our moderator, but don't Google the answers, because that's cheating. Um, and uh, one thing is, if you could just hold your questions to the end, that would be great. Um, so with that, let us jump in. Um, let me see. Okay, so we are going to um, talk about uh, what was the progressive era, the calls for reforms, women's suffrage. So you could see what's on the slide, but this talk is, I do like six or seven different talks for different titles. Some of you may have seen some of the other ones. So some of those are on like very specific things. Like I have one on New York's original Penn Station, which maybe at some point we could do with this group. Or I have a biography on Lillian Wald. We really get into depth, okay? And I have some geographic based ones like Jewish New York, which is on different places and history and cultural implications of places. But I just wanna, it's always good to like set the tone. This one's a little different because it's more topical because after all, we're covering 30 years. There's a lot of topics that we won't get to in this talk, but are in the book. Um, and so when I say the book, I'm referring to, to this, this New York and the Progressive Era, and it's um, 
this goes into a lot more depth and covers a lot more topics, but I tried to get as much as I could in this talk for you today. So we are going to talk a lot about New York State, um, but I'm also going to point out when we're talking about Greenwich Village, East Village, kind of like that general area, Lower East Side area, because after all, this is the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, and I know a lot of you are very involved with this area, so I will. I want to make that really relevant to you here. That said, I'm also going to be giving like U.S. examples, but New York can be like a doorway to understand some of these things more. Okay, let's start by what was the progressive era? So let's take a step back. Let's think about what are the contemporary headlines? And, you know, they say that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And by studying history, it gives us a context to better understand the present. So if we were to open up a newspaper any day, you would see a lot of these types of themes, right? Which you're all familiar with. Civil rights protests, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? The infrastructure has been in the news a lot big tech monopolies and whether they should be broken up, like Google or, or Facebook and so on. Um, there's been some action with unions. In some cases, unions voting against unionizing, workers voting against uni unionizing, like at Amazon and Alabama, or some, some walkouts, um, in some cases for um, cannabis legislation. So these were all, in their own way, talked about and much of the ideas around came in this period. So just want to have you keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through this. Gilded Age. So what is the Gilded Age? Well, this was a term that um, Charles Dudley Warner um, and Mark Twain were co-authors of a book called The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. Now, you all know Mark Twain, um, Samuel Clemens. Charles Warner, he was an editor at Harper's Magazine. He was famous for the quote, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. So if you think about a piece of jewelry that looks like solid gold on the outside, but if you were to peel it away, underneath lies black steel. And that is what they're getting at with the Gilded Age. It may look very sparkling with the mansions on Fifth Avenue, but underneath it all, was a lot a great income inequality and a lot of injustices which they wanted to also shine a light on. It was a time of great expansion of industrialization, urbanization, certainly the move to the city, but also of great income inequality. Walt Whitman has a quote just before this period. If the US like countries of the world is also to grow vast crops of poor, desperate, dissatisfied, nomadic, miserably wage population, then our Republic experiment, notwithstanding its surface successes, is at heart an unhealthy failure. So who were the reformers? That's a term that we're gonna be talking a lot about today. So these are the various constituencies you would say. I tried to make the size of the box correlate to how influential this group was. You have social workers uh, working directly with different populations. We'll talk about that later labor activists, suffrage activists. You also have influencers like journalists, um, in some cases, investigative journalists, other cases, muckraking journalists, politicians. There's also a group involved with this that you don't hear as much about today in this context, which is Protestant ministers. And Protestant ministers in this period were involved with the social gospel, as they called it, which was about bringing a lot of the social justices espoused in the Old and especially New Testament to bear. And they were very much about doing that. However, this movement was not successful and ultimately did not continue with the same fervor. Let's look at this timeline. So I'm doing this so that we could put, I'm, I'm giving you different terms and I wanna make sure that we're defining them and we're putting them in proper context. So you all know, that the Civil War ended in April, 19, in April 1865 and with Robert E. Lee's surrender at, at Appomattox in Virginia. Now, the Transcontinental Railroad that's completed allows for goods throughout the country to be transported in a way that also meant that a lot of the waterways were not as important. 
And you have great wealth that's built upon a lot of this industrialization. So this is where the Gilded Age begins. Now, the progressive era, which is our focus today, is many would say 1890 to 1920, a lot in, in large part reaction to the Gilded Age. So in April 1901, the Tenement House Act passed in the New York State Legislature. And uh, we'll talk about that later, but that's a good example of a reform. We have the 16th Amendment allowing for the first time personal income tax. Um, and then the Gilded Age, when do we sort of consider that period to be over? It depends. So I present alternative theories. One, January 1914. So like the, with ending with Henry Ford paying $5 a day at Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan. If you look at it as higher wages and the development of like a, let's say lower middle class with the advent of manufacturing. However, others would not say that. Um, for instance, the Flagler Museum, which is in Palm Beach, Florida, which chronicles um, the railway magnet Henry Flagler, which builds itself a Gilded Age museum, they would say this does not end until October 24th, 1929 with the stock market crash. It begins this crash, happened over a few days. Because only then was wealth fundamentally redistributed. So, um, and we have some other events here about prohibition going into effect in the very beginning of the 1920s and the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, et cetera. So let's talk about now, we're gonna focus in on the progressive era. So I would say it kind of is like three sectors at a very high level. Get into that in the book. Today's talk will really more be about one, what, what I kind of call the common good. Now, <clears throat> it's important that you know that's just one part of what they mean when they talk about the progressive era. There's also the anti-monopoly, okay? And this is about breaking up um, like a lot of these illegal trusts um, and uh, also organizational efficiency. So organizational efficiency is about using data to make decisions, which didn't really happen so much before this time. It's about, uh, you know, trying to improve outcomes for organizations and businesses. But there is a dark side to all this, okay? So there's, there's, it's not, this is, this talk is not a nostalgic look at the progressive era. It's, it's a look at the pros and the cons really of it. But you wanna think about some of the, the darker sides of these as well. And that's what I get at here. So this is, was it progressive or regressive? Well, on the progressive side, we have a lot of reasons why, which you could see on the left, some of which we're gonna be exploring today. Civil rights, and, you know, I won't read all of them because you, know, you can read on the slide, but like consumer safety, animal rights, right? You probably don't think about that. That's where you have the incipience of um, like the Humane Society and ASPCA, infrastructure expansion. We talk, remember we looked at the headline and the Biden infrastructure plan, they were talking about that here. Um, fair income tax as well. But regressive, like unions did, they tended to exclude black workers, women, unskilled. A big thing in this movement in the real dark side is eugenics. So eugenics is essentially improving human hereditary or heredity by the social control of human breeding. And there was like the American Eugenics Society. There was um, like a lot of scholars, biologists, um, Charles Davenport, who was a biologist. Um, and uh, a lot of them advocated for things like forced sterilization, typically of those who are mentally ill, um, epileptics, those, the, the phrase they would use then would be feeble-minded, you know, that had some kind of like mental disorder. So in some cases, even after this period, it did lead to forced sterilizations. It led to the idea. And also when they met with philanthropists, you know, they'd say, it's all very well to give money to different causes, but if you want to change society, you have to do that like on the genetic level. So that was like a, you know, a darker side to this. Um, th there was someone who was interested in the eugenics movement actually, who, uh, I, let's see if any of you know, um, you could put it in the chat. Um, he was very interested in how eugenics could improve society. Um, and he was, ran a lot of like 
kind of health programs. And you probably eat for breakfast some of what his company made. Who was that? You could put that in the chat. And Hugh can let us know if anyone, if anyone put that in. We, we don't, I think I know the answer, but we don't have the answer yet. Yep, Kellogg. Yep, that's Kellogg. starting, everyone's starting to say Kellogg now. <laughs> I, I right, actually got good. to see the, fir, the, the bin where the first cornflake was made, Paul. <laughs> oh, you did in, uh, Michi in Western Michigan, Battle Creek, Michigan, I guess. Yeah, good. Yes, yes. Very good, guys. So, and then like other aspects like scientific management, which we'll get into um, about kind of, like treating workers like cogs in a system, a lot of corruption and payoffs, crowding out of small businesses. So these were all sort of the darker sides. Um, I don't know if some of you came to our, 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 my talk on in, in another book, New York's original Penn Station. In that one, I get into how that was the largest railroad in the country, the largest company, but there was all kinds of like payoffs and bribery and it really like crowded out a lot of the smaller players and smaller oil companies in terms of the transport of it. And, and, the, and the president of that um, tried to, to, you know, to really change that, um, Mr. Kassat. So um, you also have another thing though, which we should talk about, which is like some progressives wanted to legislate morality and frankly overreached into citizens' lives. And some citizens, they, they uh, resented that, you know, like prohibition being a good example, like none of your business, what I do in my spare time. And uh, so we'll get into some of the implications of that. Okay, so calls for reforms, housing improvements. Um, so, you know, in 1879, it kind of begins with uh, the pro where housing reform prohibits construction of buildings with windowless interior rooms and requires that all rooms have windows facing the street, rear yard or interior shaft, particularly, and, and this is for New York State, but particularly important for the Lower East Side and the East Village. Um, in reality, this law mandated no lighter air uh, to apartments and residents, they like threw garbage out their windows. For landlords, it was basically a windfall. They had no incentive to improve their properties. They just wanted to get a lot of these new arriving immigrants into their buildings. And uh, they, they sort of packed them in. Well, in 1901, the New York State Legislature passes the New Tenement Housing Act of 1901, which banned dark, unventilated buildings throughout the state. Now, new tenements had more light coming in, windows in each room, um, indoor toilets at every two, uh, for every two families. So this really changed the game, this Tenement Act. Um, it it vastly would improve hygiene and, and, the, and stop a lot of the spread of tuberculosis, which was especially indoors. They called it the Taylor's disease. I mean, not that it wasn't still a problem, but it would curtail some of that. Um, and uh, a lot of the developers rushed to build tenements before this was implemented. Well, guess what? It was challenged in court under the 14th Amendment um, it was like citizenship rights and equal protection under the law. So it was like the, the in this case, the, um, the city versus various owners that were, that were challenging it. But the jury sided with the city and eventually um, one case made it to the US Supreme Court, which was an, an owner, Katie um, Moichen, um, versus the Tenement Housing Department. So this was a really important Supreme Court case. And the US Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Tenement Housing Department. So the law stood. And this, again, really improved the lives of a lot of residents in the area. Um, you know, we also have to think about like the, in this progressive era, there was a notion about, for, for a lot of reformers, the private sphere and improving the private sphere as a vehicle for improving the public sphere. Okay. So, Cleanliness of home, talk a lot about the family, raising, and with all that, that, and therefore there were a lot of societies that came about. Um, home economics is something I talk about in the book. Like, you know, now we kind of laugh, you know, whatever, it's something you learn about in school. No, it was a big deal then. Home economics, like even that term, 
and you would learn about like how to run a well-run home. And that was, that was a lot of the um, ways that people thought about things and how, and how to improve things, okay? Now, um, another thing is around child labor laws. So there was little public awareness about the rampant child exploitation. Um, and uh, this, was, this was like a real problem. So I have some quotes. So I try to give you in this talk, I wanna give you some like original quotes. Um, this is from 1900, a visitor to a Southern, to a, a, a textile mill. Walking up the long orderly building, you become suddenly aware of a little gray shadow restless, flitting restlessly up and down the aisles a small girl and with bare feet and pale face. She has a worn and anxious aspect as if a weight of care and responsibility rested already on her baby shoulders. The tiny fingers repair the damage at the first place and she walks listlessly to the other. With a great shock, it dawns on you that this is a child working. So just wanna give you like, you know, a flavor from eyewitnesses now, a lot of employers and families resisted child labor laws. You know, many families relied on the income of it. And uh, they would often lie about their child's age and, and dropping out of school was common. So essentially reformers saw three issues. One, employers saw children as a key ingredient to profits and they were not gonna give that up. Two, much of the public believed poverty to be an in, in individual's fault. And C, officials were paid off. So there was compulsory education until age 14, very lightly enforced. Some didn't think the government should interfere with any of this, but then if the government doesn't interfere with any of it, it's left up to the free market. And then it's like anything goes, that's the thing. Um, so there were new laws that were requiring proof of age and school attendance. There was Florence Kelly, who was a, a reformer and associated with some of the settlements. She pushed for, for a children's bureau which ultimately, and not to be annoying and keep bringing up these other talks, but I just try to connect the dots for, for people. Like it, I do another talk on Lillian Wald and, and the Henry Street Settlement. That one, we talk about the Children's Bureau and why having this as an institution they thought could advance their agenda. So that's what's really behind that. It took years for it to be passed and it was finally under President Taft. Also, schools improved, child birth deaths decreased, more family courts opened, um, and legislation passed to control the number of hours, but again, it was, it was very poorly enforced. Um, so with all this, you know, let's also look at some of the more uh, fun aspects, right? Uh, you have the idea of leisure, because you, start, you do start to get a working class, a lower middle class. And so part of it was about can cultural museums have hours that were accessible to working people? Because they tended to be closed on Sundays, for example. So reformers petitioned the museum to be open then, or maybe late during the week sometimes, but it met with a lot of controversy. So like the Met lost some support when they did so. Um, another uh, program was about taking kids, and sometimes adults from urban areas into um, nature or like often in upstate New York, to show them quote unquote real things. So Reverend Willard Parsons started, I think an organization a lot of you are familiar with, the Fresh Air Fund. Um, Jacob Reese and Jacob, Jacob Reese and Lillian Wald started the Outdoor Recreation League. So they would often buy um, abandoned urban sites and turn them into playgrounds, uh, picnic areas, small parks. This idea of, um, redeveloping urban sites. Um, also interior spaces like Clinton Hall, offering meeting spaces, dance halls, billiard rooms. Wait a minute, did I just say billiard rooms and dance halls? This is where it gets complex. That met with controversy because even though they had great aims at heart, you have to put yourself in the early 20th century. Those were considered like vices, dance halls, billiard rooms, that, that'll invite um, all kinds of trouble. So there was some sort of backlash with it as well. And just to show you like the nuances that you have with a lot of this. Um, Teddy Roosevelt and JP Morgan helped open the Museum of Natural History. You also have some, um, what, what would be considered lower brow entertainment. And I'm, and I'm putting that in quotes, you know. Um, 
Barnum's American Museums was probably the most popular site that had like zoos, oddities, what we would call freak shows. Um, circuses became popular, um, especially with like live animals and elephants. Uh, and, and there was also a big interest in the Wild West. Not really how the West was, but more a myth mythologized view of it. So there was uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which was Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley that went around and um, performed. Um, you also had um, baseball, which became, it started in, um, who could tell me where baseball started? What, what city did baseball start in, in the late 19th century? Put it in the chat. And you can tell us, if, or, or, or Leanne, if anyone um, knows. Anyone know? Any of you watch Ken Burns baseball documentary from 1994, he talks about this. We Robert Ripp says oh, Hoboken. Ahead, Hoboken. Sure, yeah. Hoboken. Right, thank you. Um, and so, you know, you have like a lot of the New York teams, Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, um, 1913 played New York Yankees. Um, and then you also have the New York Giants and, and the, the new, their new stadium on 155th. And the New York Highlanders become the Yankees. Um, I just want to say very quickly, um, it's kind of neat. I actually got to view my grandfather's, uh, like he went, this is in the 20s. So granted, it's a few years after this talk. But he would go, like in those days, autograph books were big. And he and his brother would go to Yankee Stadium and he would get players to like sign names. So it was kind of neat. I actually went and saw it for the first time. And he has like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Grover Cleveland, um, Alexander and, and the manager for it. So it was kind of interesting. And, you know, even like preparing this talk and just seeing my own grandfather who loved this sport. And in the 1920s, when it really became popular, granted that's after the progressive era, but um, okay. Now Brooklyn, the bridegrooms also called the Grays. In 1895, they were nicknamed the Dodgers. Why were they why were they nicknamed the Dodgers, do you think? What's that referring to? Put it in the chat. Any uh, any takers? They were dodging the streetcars. Yeah, and the trolleys. And the trolleys, right? Yes, exactly. So we also have the expansion of the Met as one example. You see like from its humble beginnings in Fifth Avenue and 53rd, and then shortly moving places, and then came to Central Park in 1880 and two buildings. And Central Park, which began in 1850, 1850s with Henry, with um, Olmsted and Vox, then in 1889, it was, became like this cultural center and what that meant for the city and, and accessibility. Okay. Now, let's talk about some innovative solutions that reformers came up with. So one piece is around a settlement house, okay? So these are three that are still there today. The Henry Street Settlement, Grand Street, well, Grand Street Hippie Play Playhouse is part of Henry Street Settlement. University Settlement. What, what makes a settlement? What does that mean, a settlement house? What, do, what, what did you have to have for it to be considered that? Put that in the chat. Anyone know? While we're waiting, that Grand Street Playhouse is still there, right, Paul? It, that's right, where these are all still there. Oh, it's yeah. It's beautiful. It, it, it's beautiful. And I mean, sure, you can see a performance there tomorrow. Theater, dance, and it's, it's, it's across the street from the Henry Street Playhouse. I mean, from the Henry Street Settlement. Does anyone know what a settlement is? Or It's okay if you don't. Our users say poor people or immigrants. Uh, okay, so a settlement house means it's an organization focused on a particular need of the community that aims to focus on solving for underlying conditions, not just symptoms. And this is the key thing that the workers live there. They don't just work there and then go home. And part of the reason why that's important is 
sometimes there would be skepticism in neighborhoods. Like, who are you? What do you really, you have like a hidden agenda. But by living there, they really got to know the residents and forge alliances, okay? So, I mean, today they don't live there, but you know, in this period they did. Maybe one or two lived there today. So it's about treating the whole person. It often, often these, these were sprung from disillusionment with bureaucratic institutions. So, um, like with Lillian Wald, she was a nurse and she, she was trained in a nursing capacity and she didn't like it. She found it to be very bureaucratic, rules oriented. She like in, in modern speak, she was like a social entrepreneur. She started her own um, organization, which became eventually the Henry Street Settlement and Visiting Nurse Service. Now, the oldest settlement house is in 1886, the University Settlement. And that provided a library, kindergarten, um, public baths. And there were some, many who, this really helped ameliorate conditions in the neighborhood. There was many who graduated from this, who became very famous, like early columnist for the New Yorker in 1925, George and Ira Gershwin, Abe Beam, who was mayor of New York City in the mid 1970s. So some of you are probably familiar with um, Hull House in Chicago with Jane Addams. That was actually started by her and Ellen Starr. You know, that, that's probably the most famous, although it sadly closed in, in um, 2012. Well, that would have educational and recreational. So Adams would delineate three R's, research, residence, and reform. Um, you know, Chicago's first playground, bathhouse. So a lot of this influenced Wald, it influenced Henry Street, it influenced the university settlement, because they all kind of work together on these things. There's a lot more to say about that. But in the Henry Street settlement, there's the Grand Street Playhouse, like what we talked about, which is where there was, um, it, it was where a lot of the community residents would try arts for the first time, or, you know, they would express themselves in different ways, which was kind of uncommon then. And then it became famous and had a lot of celebrities and you kind of had both. You also had a lot of, it provided like a, like a safe place, you could say, these settlement houses to discuss controversial issues for major reforms. So in the dining room of, of the Henry Street settlement, which is still there today, and I spent, a, you know, I spent time there interviewing folks for, for this and this book on the Henry Street settlement around Lillian Wald. What the origins of what organization, of what civil rights organization began or was fostered or discussions, substantive discussions were had in the dining room became what? I'll tell you, it's probably the most famous civil rights organization today. What was it? You could put it in the chat. We think it's the NAACP. Yeah, right. Oh, very good. Wow. You're a pretty good. Uh, you know what? You're getting all these answers. Most, most, most people don't know. Very good. Okay. And you know, a lot of that was in the Niagara movement in the 1901. We're not saying that like it was the first time they ever talked about it, but it, it, was a, it was a place where a lot of this facilitated. Okay, so we also have like playgrounds, outdoor spaces, you know, because there was really no safe place for kids to play with in the area that you're focused on in East Village, Greenwich Village and Lower East Side, school nurses. That was a, a, like, there were so many kids getting sick or weren't getting the proper care at home that was introduced to schools. And I mentioned about organizational efficiency, right? So that was an example of using data to make a point. Did you see a drop off in sick out rates by having school nurses to show the need to have that funded? That was what some of these settlement house workers did. Health insurance, so MetLife has a whole history of partnering with them. And one thing that they have, which they brought to the partnership was distribution network. They had the, like agents who could go around and offer this. And they had like the wherewithal to have brochures and communications in local languages. So whether it was in Italian or Greek, or um, in some cases, Polish, um, you know, many of the different Yiddish as well, um, you know, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, there weren't that many Chinese. There were some bachelors though, but more of these European languages. 
and consumer safety was another was another big area. So um, there's also like the the pandemic of 1918 and 1919 that um, these settlement house workers had to play a big role in, especially the like how are they going to treat what's happening with that with the pandemic. So this pandemic. Um, you know, just to say like one or two words about it, but we won't get into it too much. I'll just tell you a few sentences. Some of you might know. So it didn't start in Spain, but it was in World War I. Um, and it, uh, Spain was a neutral country. And so they sort of admitted that they had, they had the influenza. So it was, it was known as the Spanish flu, even though it probably didn't start there. Um, it probably spread in the trenches in the World War I. Um, it was somewhat mild, okay, in the first phase, which was the spring of 1918. Um, and in the US, when some of these soldiers came back, um, it, well, in the summertime of 1918, it decreased a lot. Now, you have a lot of similarities to what happened today. You have, um, in the fall of 1918, a resurgence, and it was very, 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 um, it, it killed most. So that's a big difference. You really didn't have asymptomatic and it also killed a lot of young adults, which is defined as age 21 to 40. Not only the elderly, but also young adults. Um, it was, you know, it was much more deadly in, in a way because while the numbers, the numbers were very high given the small population at that time. Now, uh, so you have that in the fall around the world, you had a lot of resistance to wearing masks. You even had an anti-mask society. I have pictures of trolley cars in San Francisco with someone boarding without a mask and the drivers trying to prevent him from boarding. You have a lot of, or a lot of uprisings, like you can't make us wear a mask. A lot of the things that you saw in the last year or two, you saw then. Um, I, I can tell you that, it, that in phase three, um, you had in the spring of, uh, of 1919. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a little more mild then, but, but it still was pretty virulent because it started to have different variants. And then in the spring of 1920, you have the fourth wave, which did hit New York and, and other places. Um, by the late spring, summer of 1920, so now about, this would be about two and a quarter years into this pandemic, it, it was over. That was it. And there were no vaccines. Now, uh, one thing I can tell you is it's kind of like the forgotten pandemic. It's, just, it's very interesting because until this pandemic, this was really almost never reported on. I have a whole book on 1919 that I read. This gets two pages in it. Why? How can that be that it killed so many and it was essentially forgotten? Well, you just never know what history is going to remember and what it won't. Because if you were living then, you would have definitely said it'll be remembered. But, it, but you know what? It really wasn't. However, events sometimes reemerge, even if a century later, and then it's sort of remembered again in that way. Um, okay, so let's kind of switch topics because we do have different topics in this talk. With women's suffrage, you know, the 1830s and 1840s, it wasn't just voting. It was really a discussion about inheritance rights and property based on gender, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they knew each other from abolitionist circles and they began to turn their attention to women's right to vote by the mid 19th century. Now in Seneca Falls, New York, okay, so that's near Rochester, New York, they delineated 19 abuses and usurpations of, of women's exclusion, in voting, education, and in church too. They demanded equal rights in many different fields. And there were, there, were, there were a lot of women who were absolutely against this and thought that it would really hurt the home and the family. So that's important to know. And you should also know that there were some men who were very much for this. So they had the Declaration of Sentiments. You can visit this national park someday in um, Seneca Falls, New York. But there was enormous backlash to it. In fact, the pressure was so strong that some signers reneged and they said, okay, I won't. And some even joined the other side because they were getting a lot of threats and the threats really scared them. So, um, you know, there's a lot to say about that. 
but if we kind of skip ahead with key developments. So in 1870, there was the 15th Amendment, the US Constitution, which gave black men the right to vote. Now, th this kind of split the movement. There were some for, there were some against. So I have here the key players. See, Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton, they were focused on a US Constitution uh, amendment for women. So they thought this would hurt, would hurt their cause. Whereas some noted abolitionists thought, hey, this is a great step in the right direction. Eventually though, the two organizations merge. Um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association came about. Um, so uh, basically in 1878, the suffrage amendment was penned by Susan Anthony and it was submitted to US Congress. It was defeated, right? Because remember, she was about the US Constitution. In the mid 1890s, several mountain states, sparsely populated mountain states granted women the right to vote. So the first of that was Wyoming. Um, then more US states and territories followed. Again, it was really the less populated ones. In 1912, you have 15,000 supporters that took to the streets of New York City and marched in a parade. Um, so if you, you also have uh, male suffragettes, which no one ever talks about. So I wanted to give you kind of like, a, you know, things that you might not have heard that much about. So New York City was the center of that movement and a lot of the parades, some of which again are in this geography that we're interested in, the East Village and Union Square, Greenwich Village, okay? Um, so this was in May, 1911, the parade down Fifth Avenue, speaking, writing, lobbying of New York legislatures. And, uh, you know, they were often the object of a lot of scorn and ridicule. Now, the New York state suffrage, so, you know, in January, 1915, the New York State Legislature votes to submit the issue to public referendum because that's how it works in New York State. And the New York Women's Political Union gave a lot of talks, the opposition did. Media was very opposed to all this, including the New York Times. Um, voters defeat the measure, only five New York counties approve it. But then like, there, it's a sort of a shift. Like Woodrow Wilson, who was a Southern, very conservative in many ways president, um, very, very, like had a lot of anti-Black uh, measures, like, like for government workers and so on. But he also was very against women's suffrage. But um, basically they kind of pressured him. And I think that also like the participation in the Great War changed his mind because here he is telling everyone about making the world safe for democracy. But that seems a little bit hypocritical if it's only for some of them. So it was eventually passed in the New York State uh, Legislature. Um, and uh, January 1st, 1918, every eligible female citizen. OK, so um, one thing that I wanted to read you was about um, when this was passed. So Carrie Chapman Catt, president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which I had on a previous slide, shortly after the victory reflected on this win for future generations. Mayors come and mayors may go. A hundred years from now, the deeds of the present day mayors will have been forgotten, but the children of the centuries to come will learn that on November 6, 1917, a great step for human freedom was accomplished in the state of New York. I wanna give our heartfelt thanks to the men who voted for suffrage and to those who voted no, I want to say that we won fairly and squarely. Be good sports now and accept us into the fraternity of democracy. I think that she's sort of foreseeing there'll be conflict. So this is now November 6, 1917, right? But as you know, um, then uh, soon after it was about having that US um, constitutional amendment, um, which in June 4th, 1919, both US Congress branches passed the amendment and 14 months later, gain the 75% of states needed for ratification. So true or false, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, American women received the right to vote for the first time. Put that in the chat, is that true or false? What are we seeing? Nothing yet. I feel like we need waiting music. Mm -hmm. Dom, 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 dom. <laughs> 
Oh, but some think it's false. Yeah, it's false because women in certain states have the right to vote before, like in some mountain states. So it's just important to know, like this amendment didn't like start that for the first time, but it was a national constitutional issue rather than state. Okay, so you also have black women's suffrage. Now Seneca Falls and a lot of these later efforts were seen as a white upper middle class phenomenon and working class and white women and also blacks often felt excluded. So they founded their own. Black suffrage was more community based. You have the creation of the National Association of Colored Women led by Mary Terrell that I have here on the right. And uh, you know they were, they were severe voting restrictions as you all know with the Jim Crow laws in the late 19th century that, that in essence made it impossible to vote. And then that continued into the 20th century during this time. So this organization focused like more on that. They, they felt like these concerns were ignored in favor of expediency, typically for, you know, for women of a certain class, white women of a certain class. So, you know, in the book, I talk about some of these people, but like Ida Wells was a very important journalist who talked about a lot of the lynchings that were going on and brought awareness to it as well, going on in the South. Okay, now I'm switching gears to, to um, early environmental conservation. So who can tell me what was the initial focus of early animal rights? What, what animal or, or what, which um, organism was it for? Horses. Maybe. Yeah, horses is a very good guess. And you are right, but that's not the answer that I'm looking for. There's, an, there's something even more than that initially. Okay, we have I'm gonna give you a hint. Answers. Think about fashion. What was very important for women's fashion at the time? Minx. Minx, yeah. Some people yes. said feathers. Feathers, oh, feathers, very, very good. Okay, good applause to who? Who said feather? That's the answer I'm looking for. So hats with bird feathers or even the entire stuffed bird was very fashionable in women's dress. And more than 5 million birds a year were being slaughtered. Nearly 95% of Florida shoreline birds were killed by plume hunters. So we had the advent of the Audubon Society, okay? They, they held teas for wealthy women, encouraging them to change their fashion. There was a cultural shift is what they were going for. Like Christmas celebrations, um, you know, were typically hunting mammals or birds and trying to find other outlets. Not successful, they didn't really care about all this. Um, but the Audubon Society did try to um, conserve a lot of herons, gulls, water birds. In 1910, the New York State Legislature passed Audubon Plumage Law which outlawed the sale or possession of feathers from protected bird species. And in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act to protect North American birds. So in New York state, um, among others, bird sanctuaries were, were researchers studied to improve them and, and their conservation efforts. So I mentioned earlier about welfare organizations. Um, New York was the center of a lot of these. In 1866, philanthropist Henry Berg founded the ASPCA. He lamented the plight of a lot of the animals that he saw while serving for Russian court of Tsar Alexander II. You know, he saw the farmers and peasants. He saw them like beating their horses really severely. He wanted to replicate the Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty for Animals. So he wrote the Declaration of Rights of Animals, which was influential. The New York State Legislature passed a charter incorporating ASPCA and first anti cruelty laws. So, you know, visited slaughterhouses. The ASPCA actually a model was used for the prevention of cruelty to children too. Now in 1904, the Humane Society wanted to protect horse abuse. Like one of you mentioned in the chat, horses. Yes. And the Humane Society was initially about lobbying for water holes for streets uh, in parks. You also have to remember, you had so much horse manure on the streets. It was a huge problem in New York City. It was like tons and tons of it. And it wasn't until 1909 where there was a systematic way to clean it up because it was very unhygienic. And then later there was an adoption center for cats and dogs and spaying them and getting off the streets and putting them in, in, in people's homes. Now, outdoors in a new light. So who's the man on the left? 
Who can tell me who that is? He's also on a US postage stamp, on a commemorative postage stamp. Who is that? John Muir. Yeah, father of the national parks, co-founded the Sierra Club. He was a early preservationist of outdoors, adventure. Now, he, he really helped establish national parks. Um, I have a quote, Muir has profoundly shaped the very categories through which Americans understand and envision their relationships with the natural world, okay? Here's a quote from John Muir himself. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. So we share with Teddy Roosevelt, the naturalist president, a one-time rancher, a naturalist, bird lover. Um, he was interested in taxidermy. He donated a lot of what you'll see at the New York Natural History Museum. Uh, really got a love of outdoors on his trip as a frail boy to the Dakota Territory, where he hunted bison. And uh, he, he eventually purchased a, a ranch in the Badlands, where he returned to ride and hunt. So you know he was the governor of New York State. You know that he was McKinley's vice president for six months until the assassination, served as president for eight years. Well, you know what? He came up with so many executive orders to protect public lands, preserve campgrounds, um, game reserves, new forests. So I have a statistic for you. Um, 150 national forests, 51 federal bird reserves, four national game preserves, 18 national monuments, over 230 million acres of public land. A lot of backlash from developers, um, but he really kind of set the tone for seeing land as not just something to be taken, but something to preserve, to enjoy, to appreciate the outdoors. Okay, for New York State, wanted to get you a picture of that. Um, I here's where I can't really show you the East Village of Greenwich Village too much because we're talking about you know the outdoors and nature here. But early Adirondacks um, in the northern part of the state, 1910. Is this picture? And there was like a renewed interest in outdoors, hiking, hunting. You see they're hunting here. Camping, you know, preservation. That's what it was like then. Okay, so now I have another topic. And let me just kind of, um, you know, take a quick um, kind of, you know, where are we in this talk? So I have, I'm going to do um, a little bit on workers. And then I just have a little bit on infrastructure. Um, and then we could do some questions. So we're gonna, it'll probably be like, maybe like another like 15 minutes with questions. Is that Leanne and Hugh, are we, are we okay with that? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, great. And audience, I, you know, I try to be sensitive to your needs and to, um, you know, you, I know on virtual, it's a little different than in person. I really love in-person talks. You can probably tell I like to talk. So that's also why these talks go a little long, but stretch, get up and exercise if you need to. If we were in person, I would read your body language and I'd see that you're getting a little, so go ahead, stretch. I want you to be engaged. I know people have only have certain attention, so do that if you need to. Okay, let's talk a little bit about unions and strikes. So there was an increase of, of those during the progressive era. And um, you know, there, a lot of jobs were really dangerous during this period. They were 12 hour days, there were very few breaks. Um, there was an increased industrialization, attitudes of interchangeability of workers, a lot of these like just very monotonous tasks. So worker expectations rose markedly, but wages did not. And uh, a lot were a lot of um, unions were locked out, like union leaders. There was also like locking of doors. Um, and so that created like a real problem as well. Um, there was a backlash to New York unions. So Initially, there was the Tompkins Square police riots. This was about, so this is in Tompkins Square in the, in the geography that we're interested in with, with our, you know, our talk today, okay? 7,000 unemployed people or, or some were like union workers gathered and in January, 1874, but they, there was a lot of, supposedly they didn't have the right permit or it was switched and a lot of police, you see, I have a picture of it here on top. There was all kinds of police brutality. Um, Samuel Gompers, who was a cigar maker, was caught up in that. And it was really violent and brutal. And it made him very wary about having kinds of like protests. 
Okay. Later workers asserted more rights, but the employers pushed back dramatically. Um, judges generally sided with employers. The public was largely unsympathetic with workers, but there were a lot of strikes. So there was a decrease in output in GNP and GDP. So here, Samuel Gompers, he got caught in that riot I was telling you about. Um, and, uh, you know, here's a quote from him. I, I won't read it like for time, you could see it in front of you, but he calls it like an orgy of brutality. You know, I was caught in the crowd on the street and barely saved my head from being cracked by jumping down the cellar way. This like really changed some of his outlook about how unions should formulate and how he wanted to um, institutionalize them rather than rely on other, other means. Now, scientific management is something that I mentioned earlier. So this was the idea of making um, workers um, like there was the whole thing about making them like cogs in a system for increased output. So um, that had a backlash for some industrial strategists. So the pioneers of systematic management favored peace rate schemes that encouraged workers to defy their formal and informal working rules and increase production. So Frederick Taylor, he grew up in a well-to-do family. He served as a machinist and pattern maker, and he saw the inner workings of shop floor. He wrote this book, The Principles of Scientific Management. Now he completely lacked empathy for workers though. He thought of them as paid cogs in a system, survival of the fittest. He really advocated the piecemeal compensation. Now, he also looked at motion studies, like breaking down a task. There's no thinking. As you can imagine, workers hated it and they resisted. Taylor threatened fines, layoffs. Um, it didn't really catch on formally, but here's the thing. It changed a lot of the attitudes of workers as more interchangeable. Um, and, uh, there was also the notion of like disunited unions. So again, like I mentioned about like violence of strikes escalating, sometimes they became violent because the employer hired thugs to sow discord, okay? It wasn't necessarily the workers who, who did that. There were a lot of bombings that targeted businesses and anti-union organizations. So there was violence on both sides. To Teddy Roosevelt, he, he was understanding of workers, but he questioned the closed shop system under workers and in effect were forced to join unions. But we have to talk about the fact that like I call it disunited unions because unions were often disunited by race, gender and skill discrimination. So, um, you know, many male workers saw black workers as a threat because they were generally willing to work for lower pay and under harsher conditions. Samuel Gompers felt this way too. And reducing the supply of labor was a key goal. That was his thing, that was his strategy. Reduce supply of labor through limiting immigration, okay, which eventually came to pass in 1924, through making it harder to get jobs so that they would have more ability to negotiate. Um, he was quite opposed to women workers, a belief that they should be at home, you know, accepted that they would accept lower wages and bring that down, thought of it as a cycle, the lower wages, then the men have to get another job, and so on and so forth. Um, but there were women's trade unions, uh, most notably Women's Trade Union League. You've probably seen like the WTUL. I know your society does some work around a, a lot of that. Um, and that had some too. Um, and also like unskilled workers, you know, were, were, were discriminated against as well. Now this part I'm going to, you, I bet you a lot of you are very familiar with this. So for the essence of time, I'm just going to kind of we breeze through this. I, I think the Greenwich Village Society does some commemorative events on this, you know, so you know about all this, but it was New York City's third worst disaster. It was near Washington Square. And uh, this occurred on March 25th, 1911. Um, and 146 workers were trapped and they perished from the fire, you know, for jumping out windows. So you see on the slide, if any of you are not familiar with this event, what occurred, but the owners escaped unharmed. And the trial explored whether the owners knew workers were locked in at the time of the fire. And ultimately they were acquitted and won sizable civil damages. Um, here's like pictures from what it was at that time versus today, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, 
So you can see that if you walk by that area now. Now, one thing I wanna emphasize here is that there were New York state laws protecting workers. So the tragedy finally turned the tide on pu public sympathy um, and they created the Factory Investigation Commission. And this ushered in the golden age of remedial factory legislation, like what I have here. A lot of these items I have here on the list that you could see. So, um, and then just, you know, sort of lastly, like with, and then we'll do some open it for some Q&A, like with transportation. So you have the subway opening in 1904, you have the Model T, which is built in Detroit in the Ford Paquette plant, which becomes like the first prototype of a car. And that's where the assembly line becomes um, developed. It wasn't invented there, but it became developed there. Uh, the trolley car, steam to electric. You also have the first flight, passenger flight. Uh, that was in January, 1914, um, from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida. And it covers 18 miles. And that was like very exciting at the time. So, you know, a lot of, um, you also have like the original Penn Station was built in 1910. We have a whole talk on that. And that was inspired by the Gare d'Orsay in Paris and the Bass of Caracalla in Rome and enormous engineering feat to get the East River Tunnels and the Hudson River Tunnels built. I wanna give you a national example. I think the National Alaska Railway from Seward to Fairbanks, 1914 and 1923, this was a really big deal. Um, and uh, because just imagine trying to build this railway um, through the glaciers and so on. I had the pleasure of riding it and it's kind of like an old fashioned train ride, by the way, it's really fun. This was a territory at the time. You see here at, in 1923, um, Harding um, drives the, the, the final golden spike in it. Um, and then this is just a quick video on... Just to show you like the trolley cars, um, the, the horses, the, how transportation varied by um, the different modes. There's a, there's a Model T car, let's say, um, comes in a little bit. The crossing of the streets and you know, how safe or not that was, the traffic. So this is right when the original Penn Station was built, like a year later. Yeah, I'll just give this like another 30 seconds for you to see and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay, so just for time, I will. Um... Okay, so then there is the decline of the progressive era. Um, and I will sort of leave you in suspense about why this era came to a close. Why in 1920 does it end? So you can read about that, but let me just say a few quick things about that. First of all, and this is important, many initiatives had been accomplished, right? Some good, some, some that didn't work out so well. But you did, I just wanna say, we talked about the morality overreach of the progressives. You have a return to laissez-faire government with Harding and Coolidge in the 1920s. You also had a big red scare with the Russian revolution in St. Petersburg. And this, it made, there were a lot of like bombing, little bombings here, and it kind of made people like, um, paranoid about communism, socialism, shut down a lot of this way of thinking. And in 1924, there was the um, Immigration Act that passed, which severely limited immigration and, and a lot of quotas around that. But there's many other reasons that you could read about in the book. Um, other topics covered are here in, in the book. So I definitely encourage you to get that just for your, I mean, it's, it's really just like, I'd like you to have it, you know, just in your homes to enjoy it. Um, and uh, it, it covers you know, that. So the key thing is it's at Strand Bookstore because we're trying to support independent bookstores. So it's in person in Strand. If you go there, 
or on Strand Online. Um, of, you know, of course, at Barnes & Noble, yes, online, but even online, like maybe abooks or goodreads.com. I mean, sure, it's on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com, but we're trying to promote some, like some of the independent businesses too. So it's up to you, but we just want to say that. You can also contact me if you want a signed book and we can do that offline. But it has a lot of like historic photos, timelines. It has a poem that introduces it. It explains by theme. This is all published by the History Press, by the way. And yeah, you know, there's other talks that we could do at some point, which we mentioned in the beginning, Lillian Wald, Penn Station, just like, you know, ethnic Florida, New York, um, nonprofit marketing with museums on the bottom left. And then my website, I just want to say paulkaplanauthor.com, you can go to. So at paulkaplanauthor.com, you'll learn about, the, about these books and some of the media interviews, and you can contact me, all of that here. So, you know, jot that down as well. So let me say that you were a really great audience. Sorry I went over a little, um, but I want to thank you again for your attention. That concludes the official talk. So thank you very much for that. And now we'll turn it over for some questions and to Leanne and Hugh. Thank you, Paul. I learned so much. This was, I took notes the whole time. This is thrilling. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and, and already getting lauded in the in the chat. So giving you all a moment to um, populate the Q&A because there's nothing yet. So uh, you all will do that. I had a couple questions for you, Paul, that we could kick sure. off with. So one thing I was wondering about was you mentioned the, um, the, the kind of dual nature of there, there's positive and negative for these things. So I was wondering, could you speak a little bit more about maybe the people who were left out of the progressive era? Like you spoke a little bit about the abolitionists and the black women who led things. Could you give us any more insight on that or maybe immigrants or something like that? Oh yeah. Okay, so the your question is about who sort of didn't benefit as much from some of these reforms. Okay. Yeah, so, maybe if they, they did anything about it themselves. Right, yes, I think that's definitely true. So here would be some examples. So like, as I mentioned in the, the, the suffrage movement, that, that, that's a good example of that was seen as like a white upper middle class phenomenon. So a lot of black suffragists, they started their own organization, like the National, National Association of, of, of Colored Suffragists, which, which concentrated on very different issues. It tended to be more community based. It tended to be more um, about um, like fighting some of the voting restrictions in the South and, the, and you know, starting from the Jim Crow laws. So a lot of work done, a lot of publicizing in the media, like about lynchings and Ida well, a, a lot of um, the journalists that did that. Um, now you also have, like I mentioned with unions, like a lot of, it, it was kind of like a skilled, and I, and I hate to put it this way, but it kind of was like a skilled white male, uh, they benefit from it, but not other groups, not as much, because even more there, they felt, you know what, like, it was like, they would feel like threatened, like this is going to take us away from our mission. And even more, at least the voting doesn't change their own. No, here it's like, you're going to accept lower wages. That means me and my men are going to accept lower wages. We can't accept that. Um, I think that um, a lot of, but what's interesting is when you look at a lot of, um, sometimes what brought different kinds of people together in New York was the work on a lot of massive projects though. though sometimes there was a hierarchy. So a good example of that is like I mentioned the building of um, the tunnels underneath the East River and Hudson River. We, but that was a really tough job. I mean, think about going underwater and the danger and, and the bends and all of that. Okay, so that had a lot of like blacks, it had a lot of immigrants working together, you know, in a way that you know, hadn't been done and certainly not by, by traditional means. Another answer to your question, as I mentioned in the talk, is around unskilled laborers, whatever they may be. You know, the idea that they don't need protections, um, that unions, they don't, they don't need that, don't include them. So some of the, you also asked in your question, what do they do about it? Well, a lot of unions formed from that, you know? Um, and the ladies garment worker union, you know, as an example. Um, so I think, I think these are all um, like important 
like nuances of the conversation. Um, in terms of, um, I, I would say like, in terms of like um, immigration and a lot of them tended to rely on um, Landsmannschaft organizations. So Landsmannschaft tended to be like what they call fraternity organizations. So if you, it's others that also came from your hometown, like you're from Bialystok in Russia. Well, there were others who came before you who might help you with um, housing, um, jobs, and so on, and, and finding a lot of the fraternity. And I don't wanna like bring up these other titles because that's like really annoying, but I do it just to connect the dots. So in the Jewish New York talk, I talk about um, how these organizations were able to accomplish what, what a lot of their members couldn't get from like mainstream organizations, I would say. And I would say a lot of it fell on private sphere because the government like didn't always help so much a lot of these things. Also, another answer to your question is honestly settlement houses. That's what a lot of these settlement houses did. That was so, that's so fascinating. I have two more questions I can ask, but please, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat if you can't use the Q&A form. Um, one quick question. Could you just kind of define the piecemeal compensation idea of what that was and in, in the, the worker kind of circle yeah. you showed? That's the idea that instead of getting paid by the hour, you would get paid by output. We should consider it in the context of like social Darwinism, which was rampant at the time. That was like, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, work hard, save, you'll do well. It's kind of like idealistic, like in more sort of on the right, you could say. But in reality, it was kind of a cruel system because it, first of all, if you couldn't keep up, you would barely make any money from it. And if you were sick, it was, you know, just also like if you were sick, if you, if you were a little bit older and couldn't move as quickly. And so it, it, it encouraged like injuries in order to move more quickly. You know, so there was, there was no thought to like the long term. There's no thought to, I mean, the workplace has evolved so much today in that there is a lot of that. Yeah, it was, it was sweatshops. Now, a lot, of, a lot of workers tended to work in, in, like in the Lower East Side, like in, in tenements and in those environments. But as the decades progressed, some worked in like larger environments, like in the, you know, say like the Washington Square area and so on. Um, it, was, um, it, it, it was a very tough system. I don't think it benefited the workers. And I think in some of their negotiations and unions, this was definitely a point about like, you know, would, would you get paid? From the employer standpoint, you know, they'd say, well, like Frederick Taylor would say, well, why should we pay you just because you're here? And just because you're, you're giving time, like what are you actually producing? So that's one of the, when I talked about organizational efficiency, remember it's not all good, dark side, all of it. That's, that's part of like what that's kind of coming about with. Yeah, I'll bet some people on this call just to make this more personal, you know, think about your own, um, you know, like your own grandparents, you know, or parents or great grandparents. I'll bet some of them, I know my grand, I know my uh, father's mother um, worked, like she worked in, um, I mean, I was like too young to kind of understand it, but I know that she like worked and got paid by like piecemeal kinds of things. So almost think about it, you can think about it like in terms of your own ancestry. Yes, my, my grandmother worked in, she lived outside of Gloversville, and guess what they made in Gloversville? Gloves. <laughs> and so they, they did it by, I don't know if they did it by the finger or the hand or what, but, um, and we do have a question from Alice. Thank you for asking your question, Alice. She said, uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. From your research, is the progressive era the right term for this era, or do you think we should be rethinking this and maybe a new label for the era? That's a very interesting question. Very good. I think in some ways it's a little misleading because the term has changed a lot. You know, when you say that now people think of something very different with progressive than they did back then, some things, so let's dissect that a little bit. The word progressive in some ways is about progress and making progress, that's similar. In the late 19th century today, it is about that. It's about, so that's similar. I think it's fair to say that both were interested in the common good what that was, was different, but it was. Um, it was also about justice 
and it was about trying to make society a little fairer, maybe, but, and that, because of a lot of advances, we think about that differently. So in, the, in that period, there was not as much thought of at all, at all about people of color. It doesn't mean that, you know, they were bad people, they were foreign, it, it simply means that it just wasn't part of their way of thinking. It wasn't. And they, there was some racism, you know, with some of the um, progressives, because that was just like part of society. Today, that's a much, much bigger part of that word. So it, in a hundred years, things have changed so much. I do think though that some things were also more part of that, which I tried to put in the talk, which we don't hear about as much today. So for example, like, uh, like, like fairness to small businesses, like not having big companies, having unfair advantages, unfair advantages to crowd out. You hear about it, but I guess you don't really hear about it in the context of like progressives so much. Um, you know, unions have, as you all know, have lost a lot of clout and some of it from their own corruption and their own failings for sure. But it, it just is a much smaller percentage of the US population. So I, I think this person raises a really interesting question because the term has, it kind of implies things and really the period, it, it kind of meant something somewhat, not totally, definitely some important things, but things that were kind of different then. That's great. Oh, we, we could have a whole debate about that. Maybe that's a future program. <laughs> um, so I think that's the last that we should probably wrap up now, Paul, but I do encourage you all to check out the book. It's it's at the Strand. If you want to go in person, you buy, buy it online. I will be checking it out. Um, and then Paul so graciously said you could email him uh, if you want a signed copy. So Paul, thank you so much. Any last words you want to share with us before we go? I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I want you to, as you, you know, when you, if you ever like read the papers or magazines, think about what we talked about today. Like it'll give you some kind of context, um, how history kind of rhymes. Um, you know, think about, I guess my final words are, this, this is more of a topical thing, but don't get lost. Like some of the great bravery, I think that people had too. You know, like, what, and things you might not even think about that. So like, this, this is gonna sound dumb, but like I mentioned like the building of like pen, like the tunnels or things like that. I mean, even things like that. Like when you take New Jersey transit in across the Hudson River, like think about it, who actually made these tunnels? And it was really, really hard work. Or think about, you know, a lot of the bravery in standing up for certain things, whether you were the male suffragette, suffragette whether you were the woman suffered, whether you were, you know, an early animal rights person and, and, and some of these different things. And you often, you often risk ridicule, especially if you were a person of some standing. And, and the risks, sometimes even physical, because, you know, they were violent threats, it was physical, but even emotional that people took. So, you know, just sort of think about that, think of honor these men and women of, you know, of, of, of history. I'd say that. That's beautiful. And I, I think, you know, we all think about learning from history and we definitely should do that, but to gain some like fortitude from their bravery, I think is also very beautiful. So thank you. So I'll be thinking about that every time I go through a tunnel now <laughs> on e under either river. So thank you all so much for coming, Paul. Thank you again, Hugh. Thank you again. And uh, we'll see you at our next program. Thanks so okay. much. Oh, and, and yeah, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye guys.